Thank you. Um, my first Nanog, first lightning talk, so be gentle. Uh, my name is Phil Roberts. I'm with the Internet Society. If you're not familiar with the Internet Society, we are a nonprofit organization that exists for the promotion of the open Internet for everybody. We do work in education, in public policy, in standards and technology. And in the past uh, few months, we've been focusing a lot of efforts on um, transition to IPv6 and the steps that are involved between now and then. Should I still count on 10 minutes? Or? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a, or, an organizational member study that we did. Uh, the Internet Society is supported by organizational members, and we studied what they are doing in their networks with IPv6. Uh, we have some observations that we've made on the situation with regard to v4 runout that we've been talking about in the context of the RIRs. Um, and we've been talking to operators about transition impacts of shared addressing uh, architectures, which is something that Dave got into earlier this morning. So the Internet Society has about 90 organization members, and they represent all sorts of different kinds of entities. Uh, we're supported by NRENs, we're supported by ISPs, we're supported by vendors, we're supported by various government organ organizations, all of whom have some kind of um, operational network. So during um, late last summer, we decided to ask them about what they're doing in their networks with V6, and they were very happy to participate. Um, it's also worth pointing out that we're represented by a very wide geographical diversity and um, the entities that we talked about vary greatly in size from very small to very large organizations. Uh, we have supporters on, we have organizational members from every continent except Antarctica. Um, so we asked them about what they were doing in their V4 networks and what their V4 networks were like and mostly what they were doing in their V6 networks and what they were like. Of the 90 members that we canvassed, um, somewhere around 25 responded. Uh, all of them are doing something in V6, which is not surprising. It's a little bit self-selecting, I think, in terms of uh, what people responded to. But these are some of the highlights of what they told us. Uh, we asked them about what sort of allocation they had and utilization they had in V4, and we have people who range from just consuming a few addresses to people who consume uh, upwards of slash eights and multiple slash eights. We asked them about their utilization and whether or not there would be any point in time at which they would like to or would be able to or be willing to return any of their V4 allocation. And almost all of them said no. Um, and almost all of them said that they anticipate going to get more addresses very soon. Um, we asked them what would happen if they went to get a V4 address allocation and the response came back that you can't have any more. And they said, naturally, try to be more efficient and to use more NAT. And I don't think any of them said, we'll try to move more stuff onto V6, though we know that some of them are working on that. Um, which is kind of interesting because the predominant response in terms of what are the advantages of IPv6 is that it has more addresses. But there's a gap in, in uh, between, as we know, between what people actually want to do and what people are able to do. Um, we asked people about specific business drivers that they had, and the two high runners in this were needing to have V6 capability in order to test V6 products that they were in the process of developing, or responding to a customer demand for use of V6. And we asked them about specific advice that they had um, for others intended in deploy, to deploy V6, and they said, do it now and be aware that there are going to be some pretty high training curves because uh, V4 knowledge does not automatically translate into V6 operational knowledge. So we expect to have a report published on that, and I put the link up in the previous slide, I believe. It should be out real soon now. Um, we've been working with the RIRs and trying to observe what's going on there with policy, and this is a moving target about what happens um, in the case of V4 run out. Um, but one of the important things that we've observed is that registration is something that's going to be required and whereas the RIRs don't seem to be that eager to move to a market model, they may have to, uh, the need to be, to be supporting registrations of IPv4 addresses is something that's going to be very important for them. Um, they believe that it's needed to preserve the integrity of the routing infrastructure and especially as transfers happen through the black market, gray market, maybe into a white market even. Um, 
knowing who is actually responsible for a prefix and who can inject routes for it is something that has to be done. And there's standardization work going on in the IETF to make uh, technology available to support this kind of operation. The last thing I want to mention is a follow-on to what Dave started talking about in terms of shared addressing uh, as we go from a state of uh, being able to get v4 addresses to it being harder to get v4 addresses and maybe not being able to get v4 addresses uh, and not yet having v6 deployed. And in the IETF there are a number of proposals now about different ways to share addressing. Um, there's an AP, A plus P proposal, there's DS Lite, there are various CGN type proposals. Um, and all of them kind of change the model that we're used to from having, um, you know, being able to tie an IP address to a particular identity to a very large scale sharing of IP addresses uh, across large numbers of households. Um, Elaine Duran sent a, mailing, sent a post to the Behave mailing list about this in November of 2008, and we've been talking to him about it some. We very much like to talk to other operators, and particularly to people who are providers of content, about how this may impact what they do uh, in terms of doing business on the Internet. Um, some of the shared address side effects are things that are not only how do you build this really big, monstrous, high-power, high capacity device that is a carrier grade NAT, which is what Dave talked about. Um, but you know, what are the side effects that go on people who are using the internet? Uh, what kind of things happen when people who are used to being able to identify somebody by a single IP address are now not so sure who is there? And this will impact content providers. It will impact things like geolocation, impact things like um, lawful intercept. Um, Ports become a critical resource that have to be managed, and this is something that people are aware well of. Where well aware of <laughs> um, connections that involve uh, mapping to well-known port numbers are going to have to be reworked, and UPnP kind of semantics don't hold up anymore. So those are the things that we have been starting to look at. We would love to talk to more operators about these issues and talk to content providers about these issues. So if you have any observations you would like to share, I'll be around all week. And thank you. Thank you. Phil, Phil, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Um, one of the things I try to do is um, you know, kind of do a back of the envelope calculation on what kind of data flow would come out of one of these things for either IP fix or NetLovers and mine export from this stuff? Have you guys looked at that at all? I mean, given the, given the sort of the size that people are talking about? Yeah, no, we, we know that that is something that has to be uh, considered, but we haven't done any, any kind of empirical analysis. Thank you very much.